You need a change. You need some excitement. Your life feels like it's been missold to you. Damaged goods that you're desperate to return, but sadly, you were born out of warranty. You hate your job. You hate your home. You don't have any family or friends that you feel you can connect to. Student loans, mortgages, bills overdue. You left your dreams to gather dust and crumble like some ancient artifacts in a museum's stockroom. When did it all go so wrong? Nothing has turned out the way you hoped it would when you were a kid. It's all just been a series of compounding mistakes. Why did nobody tell you after a certain point that life just seems to get worse and worse? It's not that you want to die. No, that isn't it at all. You want another throw of the dice. You want to start again, at a different place in a different time. You want to go somewhere where you can begin anew with a completely clean slate. That's when you first hear about the back rooms. It starts when you see a 4chan post, widely circulated around certain parts of the internet, an enigmatic picture of a strange featureless office building with sickly yellow wallpaper, and text reading, if you're not careful and you know clip out of reality in the wrong areas, you'll end up in the back rooms, where it's nothing but the stink of old moist carpet, the madness of mono yellow, the endless background noise of fluorescent lights at a maximum hum buzz, and approximately 600 million square miles of randomly segmented empty rooms to be trapped in. God save you if you hear something wandering around nearby, because it sure as hell has heard you. To most people, this sounds like an existentially terrifying concept, being trapped in some horrifying alternate reality, full of unfamiliar spaces and hellish beasts. But where others see a nightmare, you see opportunity. The back rooms. Is it just an urban legend, or could such a place be real? With nothing else to sink your time into, you begin your investigations. That's when you start to realize that there's so much more to this whole backrooms phenomenon than you could have possibly have imagined. There's more than just buzzing lights and yellow wallpaper. According to some fan forums and wiki pages online, the backrooms is comprised of a huge number of levels, each with its own unique ecosystems, environments, and entities. It's a whole world, a whole dimension, unto itself. A place where you could spend years searching and never see all of it. A place where you could up sticks, leave this world behind, and start a new life. However, there's one weighty caveat beneath it all. It's a one-way trip. There's no way of ever getting back from the back rooms when you're down there. You ask yourself, is this really what you want? Is life so empty that you'd be willing to trade Earth for this beige nightmare? And upon reflection, you realize, yes, you would. The back rooms is your ultimate destiny. So you begin to prepare. You've been told that while, yes, many people enter the back rooms by accident, it is equally possible to get there on purpose when you're in the know on what exactly to do. But you're not ready to start your new life in this piss-colored hell world just yet. According to all the sources you're reading online, there are certain preparations and equipment you need to take care of first, or your stay in the back rooms may be a lot shorter than you intended. Experts in the ways of the back rooms recommend bringing a first aid kit for treating any possible wounds incurred during your explorations, as well as a weapon. The weapon demands are very specific, recommending a machete or a long knife as an ideal weapon with firearms being powerful but far too risky. The sound of the report can attract all kinds of unwanted attention from the entities lurking in the otherwise empty hallways. They also recommend bringing a timer, as the concept of time is heavily scattered in the back rooms, as well as a canteen for storing water. Other than that, backrooms experts recommend bringing everything you might bring to a particularly intense camping trip. Snacks, a sleeping bag, durable clothing with plenty of spares, a backpack, a headlamp or flashlight, a ski mask, a thick coat, knee and elbow pads, and if you're feeling particularly cautious, light blockers and night vision goggles. You better come in prepared. After all, you're never coming back out again. Next comes actually figuring out how to leave your life behind and enter the back rooms. You remember what it said on the original post about how people can no clip out of reality 
and into this frightening world, like something out of a video game. But how could a person no-clip on purpose? As it turns out, the Backrooms community already has your back there. From years of experience and observation, they've figured out the secrets to no-clipping into the Backrooms. It is important to note that there are no surefire ways of entering the Backrooms, only ways to increase your chances of the no-clip. The community widely lists these as some key places where no-clip potential is far higher. Walls that are a shade darker in abandoned buildings. Doors that they look like they shouldn't lead anywhere or in a random place. Any area that gives paranormal feelings, such as hair standing up, buzzing electric currents, a sense of unease, missing the last step on a flight of stairs and falling on your face. Though the official literature specifies that this usually does not work, only in very select flights of stairs, and the anomalous properties of said stairs disappear or move after two or so entries using this method. The final stated method is interacting with a glitched chair, though what exactly a glitched chair constitutes is really anyone's guess. You decide that the abandoned building approach is perhaps the most practical way to enter the back rooms, seeing as you don't feel like intentionally falling down the stairs all day. You decide to spend the next several weeks journeying around your area with all your gathered equipment, ready for the trip of a lifetime. You hop between dilapidated buildings, running your hands across the walls, hoping this would be the one to take you to the place where you want to spend the rest of your existence. It seems almost like your efforts will be fruitless, until you reach the abandoned paper mill about 15 miles from your hometown. On the inside, you feel the strange hum of energy, the raised hairs on the back of your neck. It's almost like there's electricity in the air. Perhaps this is the place. You exhale, trying to calm your nerves and venture further in, looking at the walls until you find one that's conspicuously darker than all the others. Some part of you knows, yes, this is the one. You take another deep breath, inhaling the last lungful of air you'll ever know from this world. You stride towards the dark wall, closing your eyes before the point of contact. You open your eyes, and suddenly, you're there. Welcome to the back rooms. Is it everything you'd hoped it'd be? The washed out, ever-present halogen lighting, always flickering slightly in a way that's equal parts intriguing and maddening? The endless rows and rows and rows of hallways with that same almost featureless yellow wallpaper. The stinking, eternal carpets, damp with what many believe is spinal fluid. You can hardly believe it. You're actually here. In order to avoid losing your head, you remember the four steps from the backroom's forums. Step 1. Don't panic, as panicking causes you to lose your senses and make noise, which may attract unwanted visitors. Step 2. Make a mental note of your surroundings and determine which level you've landed in. Step 3. Accept the backrooms as your new home, because you won't be returning to Earth ever again. Step 4. Stay here as attempting to escape will most likely lead to more dangerous levels. There are no exits from the back rooms, and it is difficult to even attempt to find one, as you must pass through many dangerous levels and unlikely occurrences. Of course, you plan to follow these rules selectively. What would be the fun in just staying on level zero for the rest of your life, when there are so many other levels still out there to explore? But still, you know you need to wander around for a while first. The only way to get from level 0 to level 1 is through no clipping, just like how you got here in the first place. So you decide to take a walk and explore the locale, still haunted by those eerie buzzing noises and the squelch of wet carpet underfoot that makes you feel a little nauseous. The further you venture in, you start to see and hear strange things. Maybe it's the light and sounds seeping into your mind. You read on the forums that while there are no entities lurking on level 0, the spatial anomalies of the level itself can be disorienting, and the stimuli can cause hallucinations, both visual and auditory. And lucky you, you seem to be experiencing all of them. The humming and buzzing of the fluorescent lights are unbearable sometimes, like a power drill boring its way into each temple. You can't tell if this is a function of the other hallucinations or the thing causing them. There are these awful chittering sounds, like insect legs, and you can't tell if they're coming from the nearby walls, or worse, inside your head. Then come the voices. They're identifiably human, but they're not in any language you can recognize. You haven't even been here that long, but already 
You worry you're going insane. The hours drag on as you wander through the empty zone, a sea of drab, jaundiced yellow. You try your best to count backward from a hundred in hopes of drowning out this frightening mental noise from the voices to the bugs. Every so often, you'll pivot, hearing things moving behind you and seeing something flash past in the corner of your eye. You just keep repeating to yourself, it's not real, it's not real. Sometimes you see what looks like distant doors or staircases. Perhaps those will be the way out, your gateway to level one. But every time, by the time you reach them, they've already gone. Your paranoia is already starting to increase, and the longer time goes on, the worse it gets. You start to focus more on that drab yellow wallpaper. Do you see something moving behind the pattern? Are those insects? No, it can't be. It's all in your head. But you keep thinking. Have I seen this section of wallpaper before? You know time and space don't work the way they should in level zero. What if you're just going in circles until you dehydrate or starve? You begin to wonder if your old life back on Earth was really so bad, but it's too late now. You're trapped here. There is no escape. The only way to go is deeper now, and just hope that what you find down there is more horrific than this. The one moment of salvation is when you find yourself in a small square room with manila walls. There you find documents left over from other people who'd been trapped here, reaffirming much of what you already knew. A key part of one of them reads, Level Zero. This is the level you are currently within. A unique property of this level is its isolating effect that prevents any two wanderers from seeing or interacting with each other, even when standing in what should be the same location as well as its shifting non-Euclidean nature. No clipping as described earlier is the only safe, documented way to exit this level. Level 1. Reaching this level should be your next goal. Our primary base, which is one of the safest locations for you, is located here. Level 1 takes the appearance of an infinite warehouse, stocked with crates full of supplies. Crates of supplies. That sounds nice. You exit the Manila room and keep searching traveling around on what very well could have been an infinite loop. Welcome to the back rooms. One way or another, you are going to die down here. And you know on other levels that there are nightmarish creatures lurking around too. But you'll take dying to them over dehydration or starvation. And just when you think you're about to lose your mind, you see it. A wall that seems conspicuously darker than the rest. Could this be? You feel that hum of energy again, the hair standing up on the back of your neck. You smile. Yes, yes it is. Things might not be so bad here after all. You close your eyes and step forward into the unknown. Stick around for level one. Let's see just how deep this rabbit hole goes. Welcome, Explorer. If you're seeing this, it means that you're one of the select people who have been able to noclip into the back rooms. You ought to give yourself a pat on the back for that. You're one of the winners here. You just made it to level one, the habitable zone. You take a deep breath, sucking in a waft of thick, metallic air that tastes like an oil slick. Your first impression is that it looks a little like an abandoned warehouse that's seen better days, or one of those spooky parking complexes you were always afraid to walk through after late shifts at work. But here, fear isn't an option. It's like Dune. Fear is the mind killer. You lose your head here, and you might also lose your life. That's why you decide to venture cautiously into this new concrete mess of an environment, propelled by a mixed curiosity and the hunger nagging at your belly. There has to be something here. It isn't the same featureless nightmare that the last place was. Maybe here, you can find some well-deserved goodies. You continue to walk as the concrete world reels past you. The longer you spend here, the more reality starts to feel slightly altered. You notice that it's oddly cold in here, so much so that in some areas, deposits of mist hang close to the floor. In other places, the mist has thickened into slick sheens of condensation or dark reflective puddles on the ground. The wrongness of a place like level one isn't as obviously evident as level zero, but over time, the creeping sense of dread seems to rise and rise. With every open space, illuminated by flickering halogen lights up ahead, with every long, dim corridor with phrases like Welcome to Hell and No One Escapes spray-painted on the walls. With every hall dotted with great concrete pillars that could be hiding anything, 
you start to feel your heart rate rise. You begin to wonder, weren't there meant to be people on level 1? You were sure that you read that back in the Manila room on level 0. The document had said, level 1, reaching this level should be your next goal. Our primary base, which is one of the safest locations for you, is located here. Level 1 takes the appearance of an infinite warehouse stocked with crates full of supplies. You haven't seen any of those mythical supply crates yet, but you're holding out hope, because what else can you do? That thing about the primary base was also encouraging. That means other humans are out here, possibly even in force. Safety in numbers. Wouldn't that be a fine thing? Your stomach grumbles painfully again, and you keep walking. After what could have been hours of more walking, your heart flutters. You see a person in the distance, standing beneath a flickering light. And look at that. They're standing over what looks like a crate of supplies. At long last, it seems like your luck is turning in the back rooms. You break into a steady clip and make a beeline for the only human you've seen in days. You call out, saying you're here and you're human too. You can already taste the energy bars and the delicious almond water. It'll taste so good. But you can't help but notice the person leaning over the crate in front of you isn't moving. They aren't reacting to anything you're saying. Like they're a store window clothes mannequin just fixed into place. In an instant, you feel this unassailable dread wash over you. You grind your heels into the ground and come to an abrupt stop. As if sensing you now, the stranger jolts to life and begins to turn. There's something terribly wrong with his face. Namely, the fact that he literally doesn't have one. Just a smooth, slightly domed, egg-like face, with no features whatsoever. Moving almost robotically, the faceless man begins to walk towards you. You scream and run as fast as you can, perhaps sensing wisely that there is safety in the light. The entity you just ran into is a being commonly documented in the back rooms, known as a faceling. These frightening tricksters come in a variety of terrifying flavors, and if you don't want your time in the back rooms to be cut abruptly short, you're best off staying away from them at all costs. Not that you need to be told. You're already running for the hills, not even bothering to look where you're going, taking entryways and corridors at random, doing whatever you can to put greater and greater distance between you and it. By the time you actually feel safe enough to stop, you're in another place you don't recognize, and the faceling is nowhere to be seen. Thank goodness for that, right? But you realize there is no endpoint, no absolute salvation or safe zone. You just need to keep wandering and hope you don't encounter something even more dangerous. Here's the thing. There are, theoretically, plenty of actual, real-life human beings trapped on level 1 of the back rooms. The problem is, each level is constructed out of millions of miles of alien geometry, not bound by the same laws of physics that dictate our home dimension. You can travel through these haunted halls for a thousand lifetimes and never encounter another person. It's all pure chance. The only thing that matters is surviving the next moment, because that next moment is never a guarantee. Because when you're searching for salvation in the depths of the back rooms, you have to remember that there are always other things searching for you. You continue walking, still trying to catch your breath after your recent escape. You're so desperate for some food or some almond water, the drink that's allegedly inexplicably all over the back rooms. You're even hungrier and thirstier after the run. Damn it, why did you even want to come here again? Was life really so terrible before? You enter another warehouse storage room filled with large boxes, with rotted planks barely held together by rusty nails. More condensation here, and more of those large, dark puddles on the floor. That's when an idea crosses your mind. If the mist is safe to breathe, then presumably it's just water, right? And that means, in puddle form, it should also be safe to drink. Granted, you weren't exactly eager to slurp water out of a puddle, but these are the kinds of things you need to do in order to avoid a horrific death via dehydration. You pick the puddle that looks the least dark, settling on one that seems to have a slightly silvery quality to it. Not ideal, but it would do. You dropped to your knees and leaned in towards the puddle, preparing to swallow your pride and swallow some of this nasty floor water. You wish you were braver about this kind of thing, but believe it or not, your hesitation actually saved your life this time around. You're about an inch away from the silvery water when, in an instant, it takes the form of a terrible grasping hand and reaches for you. 
Your reflexes pull you back from the wriggling fingers, scrambling back on your butt as the puddle seems to reshape and transform. It had never been real water. It was actually another common hostile entity in the back rooms, known as a duller. The reason that even things as innocent as puddles can't be trusted in the nightmare space. Dullers are large, devious monsters that function as ambush predators. They take on a semi-liquid state and imitate an innocent puddle on the ground, just waiting for some unlucky explorer to come and stick their feet where they shouldn't. At that point, it'll latch onto its victim and never let go, dragging them into its form and ruthlessly devouring them. Very few people who come into contact with a duller in their liquid form live to tell the tale, so you just nabbed yourself a hell of a lucky break from an otherwise certain doom. But you're not out of the woods yet. The duller now in its physical form begins lumbering towards you. You've got no time to recover. You need to get up and move right now. You spring up to your feet and run for it before the duller has a chance to go for round two. You keep running, room to room, hallway to hallway, through this warehouse straight out of perdition. It's exhausting. Is there literally anywhere you can relax in this place, even for a moment? If you're lucky enough to survive this horrifying episode, you can bet your ass that the future PTSD is already in the mail. But as you're running, you suddenly stop, noticing that you're in an oddly dark corridor. The lights flicker on only occasionally, giving brief moments of illumination. The active fear that came from running from the duller begins to melt away instead replaced by the icy dread that you've come to associate with the many ambiguous terrors of the back rooms. You just know something terrible is about to come round the corner. You just didn't quite expect that feeling to be completely literal in its accuracy. With each flash of light, you see a door squeaking ajar and something moving behind it. There's a low, guttural growling noise, something primal and vicious. You get the sense that whatever's behind there it is a truly dangerous predator. It enters, beginning with a tangle of filthy matted hair that obscures whatever face might be underneath. With each flash of light, you see a little more. It has human skin, each of its limbs seemingly oddly human in isolation, but the configuration is all long. Its body is built almost like a hairless dog, a badly assembled jigsaw puzzle made of human parts. Also, it's hungry and you look like food. You naturally turn to run, and it gallops after you on all fours, growling and snarling. While this living nightmare is new to you, it is a very familiar creature for veteran explorers and survivors of the back rooms. They're referred to as hounds, dangerous bestial monsters that hunt down survivors to either devour them or infect them. That's right, infect them because these creatures carry a dangerous pathogen, often referred to as the hound virus. It's fast acting, can spread through bites, and leads to a horrifically painful transformation that converts human beings into hounds themselves. Of course, that fate doesn't sound all that fun to you, so you run like hell. Remind us why you wanted to come here again. Don't get us wrong, we know bills, rent, the job market, and student loans suck, but there's gotta be a better alternative than this. Adrenaline carries you where more conventional energy fails to step up to bat. You can hear the growl of the hound as it follows you for about 20 solid minutes of relentless running. It feels like a miracle when you enter a new room and the growling behind you gives out. You're safe again, for now. And for now never seems to last as long as you would hope it would in the back rooms. You think to yourself, panting and on the edge of tears, born from a mix of immediate fear and low, nagging hopelessness, it isn't fair. It just isn't fair. That's when you see it, parked about a foot in front of you. A big, beautiful supply crate, made out of a relatively pristine looking wood. After the trio of horrors you've seen today, it feels like seeing the pearly gates. You approach with ravenous intensity and pry the lid off the crate with your fingers. Inside enough almond water and energy bars to last for days, you eat and drink your fill. It's the first time in a long time that you feel close to happy. Perhaps with this small light in the darkness, you'll have the strength to keep going, but nothing can prepare you for what you'll encounter next. After taking your fill from one of the supply crates, you take a moment just to breathe and assess your next options. You've been running through the halls of this hell like a headless chicken. It's time for you to calm down and get methodical. Otherwise, you might get lost in level one forever. Don't you want to at least find your way to level 2 before you bite the big one? 
You shove as many energy bars and bottles of almond water into your bag as you possibly can, just to avoid the encroaching horror of starvation and dehydration later. It's a little less exciting than some of the other ways you can die around here, but it's the most common way to go. Even if you're the kind of supreme badass who could kick most backroom entities through the nearest wall, you're still vulnerable to starving to death. So you continue your journey through level one, searching for some kind of way out. You read somewhere that finding your way through the right aperture can lead you to no clipping into level two. You don't know much of what's supposedly down there, but so far level one has been an absolute nightmare. So surely can't be much worse than that, right? Of course, you will come to regret thinking that. As you pass through warehouse floor after warehouse floor, corridor after corridor, you see something miraculous. Another human being dressed in cobbled together tactical clothes and wielding a machete, recently stained with black blood from some unknown source. But seeing black blood on this stranger's blade is definitely better than seeing red. The person smiles, raising the machete and asking if you're human. When you say yes, which to be fair he already knew, he lowers his blade and beckons you over for a handshake. The stranger tells you his name is James, and that he's a raider. This frightens you. You've played a whole bunch of Fallout games, so when you think raider, you think bloodthirsty psychopath that will kill you and steal your stuff. But this is only because you're not that familiar with some of the factions at play in the back rooms. Of course, there are far too many groups and factions to discuss right here, but all you need to know about the Raiders is that they're big fans of freedom. They hope for the backrooms to stay independent, rather than being ruled by the same systems of greed and corruption that rule the world outside. They want the backrooms to remain the strange new frontier that it was always meant to be, for those who actually want to be there, at least. James the Raider tells you that they lost the rest of their team in a scramble after they were chased by a whole pack of hounds. He even managed to kill one, hence the black blood on his machete. He's established a camp nearby, and if you want to come camp with him overnight, you're more than welcome. There's safety in numbers. You decide to take him up on his offer and camp out with James the Raider for the night. Perhaps in the morning, the two of you can go out on a hunt for an exit or other explorers the next morning. He's busted up an empty supply box and used the planks of wood as firewood. It's clear that this guy has been here much longer than you. You hope with enough time, you might be able to learn from this man. Maybe with the knowledge imparted to you, the back rooms might become the fun, exciting adventure you hoped it would be. James says he'll take first watch, cleaning the blood off his machete with a rag. You can get some well-earned sleep at long last, and given how exhausted you feel, you welcome it but it's a rough, uneasy sleep. You keep having dreams filled with strange images, huge, hissing metal pipes snaking off into infinity, glowing eyes and teeth in the darkness, looking at you, getting closer and closer. What does it mean? You haven't encountered anything like it in the back rooms before, so you have no idea where this frightening image comes from. But the eyes and glowing teeth keep getting closer and closer and closer. When they eventually reach you, you bolt upright, awakening with a scream. You're breathing heavily, drenched in sweat. The fire is down to its last dying embers. You're alive. You're safe. It's okay. It's no surprise that hanging around with the monsters in these otherworldly locales would lead to strange dreams. You look around for James, but you can't see him. Panic begins to tiptoe down your spine, vertebrae to vertebrae. Did he leave? Did a monster get him? All these thoughts race through your mind until a figure begins approaching you from the shadows. At first, you're afraid. Could it be a duller or a faceling? Nope, just James. You couldn't be more relieved. You ask him if he's okay, and he just flatly replies, hello. You pause for a moment, a little confused by his response. But before you can ask another question, he simply repeats, hello, once more in the same flat tone. You rise to your feet, realizing now that something is terribly wrong. James just stares at you. There is something terribly wrong with him. When the light above flickers on slightly, you start to notice how incredibly dead his skin looks. It doesn't look like his skin. It looks like something else wearing his skin. And in this regard, you're completely right. While you slept, James was attacked by an entity known as a skin stealer, which, I mean, come on. It's in the name. You can probably guess what a dude called the Skin Stealer did to your new friend here. There's no time to grieve. 
The Backrooms is an easy-come, easy-go kind of place. All you can do now is survive. You jump to your feet and charge into the nearest hallway as the shambling skin stealer wearing what used to be James chases after you. The Backrooms may be a horrific place, but at least it's giving you plenty of opportunities to work on your cardio. You didn't do nearly enough of that back on the outside. You break into a mad dash until the noises of the skin stealer disappear behind you. You're barely even thinking. But when your mind slows down and resumes normal operations, you realize you're somewhere different. You're in a long, dark hallway, threaded with giant, hissing pipes like metal arteries. On the inside, you feel cold, but on the outside, you're sweltering. You recognize this place, exactly as it was in your dreams. Congratulations, Explorer. You just made it to level two. Want to stay tuned for the next exciting exploration into the Backrooms as we delve deeper and deeper into this liminal abyss? Be sure to subscribe to Backrooms Explained and turn on notifications so you never miss another expedition. Welcome, Explorer. Back so soon? Just kidding. We know you aren't going anywhere. You made your way into the Backrooms not too long ago, and that's a one-way trip, dear friends. One way or another, you're going to die in here. The big question is which level you'll meet your end on, but you've at least made it to level two. Nobody can take that away from you. Well, actually, I can think of a few entities that can, but we'll discuss that later. You're on level two now. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Because we're sorry to inform you of this, the level one was easy mode. It's only going to get nastier and nastier from here. So far, the best thing you can say about this place is that at least it's a little more straightforward than level one. Whereas the former was a mix of rooms, halls, corridors, and closets, level two is a pure network of extra-dimensional underground tunnels. They stretch on with seemingly no end in front of and behind you, connected to other tunnels stretching off in different directions, forming an endless latticework of overheated passages that you couldn't even hope to explore. But you don't intend to spend a lifetime here. Regardless of how long or short that lifetime ends up being, you start walking. You can't exactly see or remember how you got into here. Did the entrance disappear behind you, or did you just completely no-clip through the wall? Who knows? All you know is that you need to keep moving. You walk down the tunnel, holding and taking sips from the almond water as you go. It's so impossibly hot in here, like you're walking through a literal sauna. You need to dodge the occasional puff of boiling steam busting out of cracks in the pipes, knowing it'll probably boil your skin off if you get caught in it. You keep walking, remaining vigilant. When you hear strange scraping noises in the distance, you decide to make yourself scarce behind a small collection of jutting pipes. You're frankly sick of running at this point, so you're just going to put all those hours of outless playtime to good use, and hide instead this time. If it doesn't work, at least you won't survive to regret it for long. Something approaches, lumbering down the tunnel, dragging its huge claws along the metal pipes, screeching and spewing sparks. It's a huge gray creature with massive gnarled claws. The creature is known as a scratcher. It doesn't have any eyes, thankfully. It just listens extremely closely when it's hunting, waiting for even the slightest sound. It's hungry. It wants to feed. If you can stay quiet, though, you might have a chance to survive this one. You hold your breath, trying to remain calm. One strain noise means death. It's getting closer, probing around the pipes with its claws, its lips curled back to reveal gums and fangs. Is this going to be your last moment? Then, somewhere deep in the distance, a pipe clanks. The scratcher hears the distant clank and gives chase, galloping on all fours down the pipe-filled tunnel at freakish speeds. You're safe again, for now. While you're hiding behind the pipes, you decide to unwrap an energy bar and quietly snack on it. Near-death experiences can work up a hell of an appetite. When you're confident that the scratcher is gone, you decide to crawl out of your pipe-filled hiding place and continue walking deeper into level two. Wiping the sweat from your brow with the back of your hand, 
The heat is unbearable, but at least the hiding places make running less of an issue here. And so far, the only monster you've discovered is blind. You've always been good at staying quiet, so maybe here you're going to have a slightly easier ride. Aside from the fact that warmed up almond water tastes revolting, you keep walking. Story of your life, right? But here somehow you feel a little more confident. You dare crack an ever so slight smile. Maybe you're starting to adjust to this whole backroom situation. As if just thinking that was enough to constitute a challenge, the lights above begin to flicker. You freeze in place as the section of the tunnel goes completely dark. Could it be another scratcher? Maybe you just need to stay still, but it isn't a scratcher. A pair of glowing eyes and a set of glowing teeth suddenly illuminate in the dark. You recognize it from your dream. It starts getting closer. Well, not having the proper nomenclature is really the last of your worries right now. The monster standing before you is a mysterious entity known as a Smiler. Their neon grins pervade many of the backroom's levels, hunting for easy prey. While they live in the dark, they're attracted to any and all sources of light. Lucky for you, you don't have your flashlight on you right now. But unlucky for you, you don't know all of this. Because if you did, you know that turning on one of your light sources and throwing it in the opposite direction is the best possible way to survive an encounter with a Smiler. How very silly of you. But hey, we can't entirely roast you for your behavior here. Staying frozen in place and maintaining eye contact really is one of the best things you can do in this situation, even as the grinning nightmare draws even closer. If you started to panic or turn to run, then the Smiler would take that as an invitation, leap on your back, and more fall over you. Nobody knows how exactly a Smiler kills its victims, but we can assume it doesn't just use all those long, sharp, glowing teeth for grinning. That being said, seeing as you're in a very narrow corridor right now, your options for escape are extremely limited. You're currently speedrunning all stages of grief until you reach a kind of placid, guess I'll die, acceptance. There are worse ways to go than getting chomped by a Smiler's glowing jaws, surely. That's when a ball of light sails over your shoulder from behind. It seems like an abnormally bright industrial glow stick, sailing in a smooth arc, bouncing off the distant ground and tumbling into the darkness. Lucky for you, it's enough to distract the Smiler, who immediately pivots and follows it into the darkness. Somebody just saved your life. Come with me if you want to live, calls a rugged, manly voice behind you. You turn and see him there, flanked by a pair of subordinates, both wielding planks of wood with rusty nails sticking out of them. He's a tall, broad-shouldered man, his lantern jaw peppered with light stubble, his biceps ripple out of his sleeves, his eyes a piercing blue, his hair is pulled back and tied into a manly ponytail. This is the man who saved your life, your Jack. Angel. His name is Austin, and you don't hesitate for a second to run down the corridor with him and his men. He's the kind of guy you'd be happy to follow anywhere. He and his men lead you into a nearby utility room, where he's hidden a variety of supplies. Almond water and energy bars are plentiful, along with a wide variety of weapons. He tells you he's impressed that you managed to survive all the way to level 2 with so little firepower. As it turns out, level 2 is one of the only levels in all the back rooms that can be accessed directly from the normal world. You shudder at the thought. Going from level 0 and level 1 was bad enough. The idea of unexpectedly clipping from reality straight into this pipe-ridden nightmare scape feels like it'd be a one-way street to certain doom. Austin hands you a revolver, its cylinder full, as well as five additional bullets. He tells you that this might save your life someday, but if you're not careful with it, it could also be the catalyst for your demise. After all, guns are loud, and when monsters down here catch wind of a couple of reports, they'll come running like it's a personal dinner bell. You nod, taking it all in. Austin also tells you that what you're seeing here is a small detachment of his level 2 settlement. In total, there are about 30 people down here that organize themselves into small three-man scouting groups, going on daily reconnaissance missions and shifts to gain a better understanding of the mysterious area around them. Knowledge, after all, is power. It's the best way they can come to master the place they're trapped in. 
The next step will be finding your way to their main level 2 encampment, where the rest of the group is located. You can meet them and start your new role as a member of the team. While you initially wanted to go to the back rooms to see it all, to explore, to get some excitement, after the horrors you faced, part of you just wants to settle down on level 2 for a while and earn your stripes. You can build alliances and train yourself with the different weapons available to you. So when, perhaps in weeks or even months' time, you actually make your way to level 3, you can feel ready for the challenge. But the second you, Austin, and the two others step out from the utility room when you've been planning, restocking, and arming up, you're surprised by a sudden, confusing attack from a new enemy you've never encountered before. They roll towards your group down the narrow, pipe-filled corridor like tumbleweeds made of human flesh. A chaos of wheeling limbs with deranged, frantic energy moving impossibly fast for creatures that have such a chaotic construction. These entities are known as the Clumps. The person to the left of Austin runs forward, preparing to strike at them with his nail board, even when Austin yells for him to fall back. He's quickly swarmed by the oncoming tide of clumps, which beat and claw at him with their chaotic configuration of aggressive limbs. Austin yells for the rest of you to run and scatter as quickly as possible, or you're screwed. You heed his words, considering he's already saved your life with his expertise once today. Each one of you disappear down different corridors. The clump horde breaks up into smaller groups, chasing each one of you down. You lose sight of Austin and the other survivor, but now isn't the time to worry about that. You just keep running, hoping you'll find somewhere to hide from these disgusting new monsters. The pipes seem to heat up, going hostile, hissing more caustic steam. They hold no refuge for you now. You can only run, oh that old chestnut, as the clumps get closer and closer. But wait, what's that in the distance? Is that another door? To a new hallway? To a utility room? It doesn't matter as long as it puts another barrier between you and them. You speed up, making a mad dash for what could be your only salvation. You just hope to the god of the back rooms, if there is one, that the door is unlocked. At the last possible second, with the clumps hot on your heels, you reach the door and throw it open, slipping inside. You slam it behind you and lean against it, breathing hard, waiting for the boom, but it never comes. Congratulations, you escaped, but you're not on level 2 anymore. Out of the frying pan, and into the very jaws of hell. Welcome to level 3, Explorer. Welcome, Explorer. Still trapped in the back rooms, are you? Well, no surprise there. It's not like there's ever been any recorded escapes from this terrible place. But hey, maybe you'll be the first. <laughs> oh, sorry. The prospect just struck me as a little amusing. Don't mind me. Anyway, where were we on your long and winding journey deeper into oblivion? You've opened the door and walked into a new place. Below you, a floor made of dusty white tiles, like filed bone. Above, an unforgiving metal ceiling, with steel gates corroded with rust and dripping with deposits of crusted on. Well, you probably don't even want to think about that. The dirty brick walls standing on either side of you look ancient and chipped, in some places bearing the echoes of scratching fingernails. Pipes snake along the tops and bottoms of the wall, hissing and gurgling, cracks dribbling a thick black liquid that smells toxic and makes you feel dizzy to even look at. In the distance, machinery hums, whirs, sparks, and roars, like you're trapped in the belly of some great metal beast. Heat prickles on your skin. Did you see something move in the distance? You're not sure. All you know is that almost instinctively, your hand finds its way over to the revolver and the handful of bullets in your pocket. You sense that you might need them soon. Why wouldn't you need them after all? You've just walked into hell. Or as we call it around here, level 3 of the back rooms. Do make yourself at home. After all, it might end up being your final resting place. You take a deep breath and start to walk deeper into the first corridor. The machinery seems to get louder and louder the deeper you get into the hall. It's the grinding metallic embodiments of dread. If your fear could make a sound right now, it would be that exact sound. Silent Hill Otherworld eat your heart out. 
You didn't realize just how much you valued your interactions with other human beings on previous levels until you got here. Level 3 is like if loneliness had big, hungry jaws, full of grinding, gnashing metal teeth. Incidentally, while there's no way for you to know this, Level 3 is actually one of the biggest levels that the backroom has to offer. Its area is estimated to be a staggering 350 million square miles, which is over 14 times as big as the entire circumference of planet Earth. That's why your likelihood of actually running into other human beings in here is extremely low. But hey, keep your chin up. There are still plenty of other things you're way more likely to run into down here. You keep moving, trying to push out the sound and the fear. You've survived this far, that's gotta count for something, right? You keep repeating this like a mantra to yourself, hoping it'll give you strength as you approach a rusty iron door and pull it open with a high-pitched whining screech. The sound makes you cringe. Your time in the back rooms has taught you that drawing attention to yourself around here is a very bad idea. So you try to stay discreet whenever possible, there are plenty of things down here you don't want noticing you, and it won't be long before you run into one of them. You pass through the endless matrix of grimy, bricked-up hallways. It reminds you a little of Level Zero's complex and maze-like spatial layout, but with all the industrial grease and grime of Level 2. If you weren't almost sick to your stomach with fear, it might almost be nostalgic. You allow yourself a perverse little chuckle about that. <laughs> What a strange experience this whole thing had been. Ironically, it really made you appreciate the life you ran away from. There is an eerie expansiveness to this place, but not much uniformity to each individual room and passageway between rooms. You keep pressing onwards, because you've learned by now that it's the only thing you can do down here. Sometimes you're walking through vast cavernous tunnels filled with hissing pipes, Sometimes it's passageways so narrow you need to enter a prone position and crawl along on your belly to avoid the seemingly ever-lowering ceiling. It's like a funhouse without any of the fun. You make your way into a slim, slimy corridor where you turn sideways and try to avoid the sludge dripping down the bricks. The very fact that you haven't seen anything yet somehow makes you even more nervous. The anticipation is bubbling over, knowing that somewhere in these millions of miles of hellish passageways and rooms, there are plenty of entities that want to hunt you down and teach you a new definition of agony. As you walk, you find a vast cavernous passageway with a curved metal roof. In the distance, you notice a metal grate, like prison bars, separating one half of the passage from the other. You approach the bars cautiously, Looking at the darkness in the distance, is that a single flickering light you can see beyond all the dark? Do you see someone standing in the light? You're really not sure. You get a little closer, practically touching the bars. That's when the shape in the distance disappears out of light, gone. It's hard to explain, but there's something about these bars that fills you with dread. It's though when you look at them, you feel trapped. It's like you're locked in a big cage with huge invisible eyes staring in at you. You're being watched, but by what and why? Against all your better judgment, you try to get through the bars, but your body won't fit. You try to rattle the gate, trying to find some kind of lock or vulnerability in the metal, but you can't find anything. It won't budge. But hey, if it makes you feel any better, you won't be the first to be defeated by these supernatural bars. To the best of our knowledge, they're completely impervious to any kind of infiltration method. Lockpicking, brute strength, pliers, industrial flamethrowers, and even explosives. There's nothing you can do. So rather than pursuing the issue, you decide to cut your losses and continue your exploration. There's got to be more strange things to discover out here. Here's something you may have not known. The nickname for level 3 of the back rooms is the Electrical Station, and you're about to find out why. As you pass through another slightly larger corridor, you notice that the pervasive noise of electricity and running machinery is even louder here. It feels almost like a drill boring into your skull. Every instinct in your body should be to run for the hills, but instead you move towards it, hoping that maybe finding out the source of this noise will reduce its power over you. You reach a heavy metal door slightly open, 
You grab the edge and force it to the side, grunting and straining all the way. On the inside of the room, you can see something that looks remarkably like an electrical substation. It's a huge, bizarre collection of different electrical mechanisms. Conductors, insulators, lighting arresters, so many wires and pulleys and gears, all twisting and burning, crackling with blue tongues of electricity. There are millions of rooms just like this all over Level 3. Together, they produce an incalculably large sum of electricity, blasting power across the millions of miles of tunnels and halls and rooms. You begin to wonder if, maybe, all these power stations that infest Level 3 are what's keeping the flickering halogen lights on over the rest of all of the back rooms, like a heart pumping blood to all the organs and tissue around it. So many interesting theories are rushing through your head, but they're interrupted by the sound of a strange, almost human muttering, somehow still audible amidst the din of machinery. You turn to see a figure standing in the corner, shambling towards you out of the dark, teeth chattering, murmuring deranged nonsense. As it gets closer, illuminated by the glow of the machinery, you can see it fully and can't help but feel a little sick. It looks like a model of a human being made out of rotting hamburger meat. Its sallow eyes, its jagged, mismatched teeth. It reaches out, grasping with gnarled fingers. Your equal parts terrified and utterly repulsed. And the most horrifying part of it all? This creature was once a human being. Monsters like this are known as wretches. The exact science of how they come to be is unclear. But these entities were once people much like you. Trapped in the back rooms, wandering around, racked with hunger, fear, and despair. Some people, the lucky ones, who starve in the back rooms, just die, and that's the end of it. But others enter what is known as the cycle of despair. The horror, pain, and longing they experience begins to leak out of their psyche and into their physical body, slowly warping them into rotting monsters that are so much less than the humans they once were. You don't have much time to just stare and gawk in horror, because the wretch charges towards you, arms extended like Frankenstein's monster. It claws at you, trying to grab your face, and you manage to clutch its wrists just in time. For something so decrepit, it's surprisingly strong. It cackles and growls insanely. It wants you. It wants your blood. Being in the back rooms has, if nothing else, strengthened your will to live. You won't die here. Not to this monster. Not to this other person who failed where you're going to succeed. You summon up all your energy and give the wretch a mighty push. It tumbles backwards onto the nexus of machinery behind it and begins convulsing horribly as the electricity courses through its body. You're transfixed. It screams and its body seems to glow. Then, boom. The wretch explodes, spraying you with a mist of awful rotten meat. The creature is dead. It feels like a special moment. You actually turned the tide on a backrooms monster for once, and actually killed it. Maybe you don't need to run anymore. Maybe you're on top now. Then you hear the footsteps. More wretches, a whole group of them, alerted by the noise of their brethren's messy demise. They're after you now. Too many to fight. Even if you whipped out your revolver and unloaded the cylinder into one of these freaks, seems your running days aren't quite over yet. You turn tail and sprint off into the bowels of the level, hearing all those horrific meaty footsteps slapping on the ground behind you. You have a tried and true method by now. Run like hell until the chase stops. Worry about the painful buildup of lactic acid from not warming up later. There's very rarely time to stretch properly in the back rooms. When you come to a stop, you're finally safe. Well, as safe as a person can be down here. You take a moment to breathe. That horrific metallic grinding from the countless pieces of electricity-consuming machinery is giving you a migraine. You need to get out of this level. Forget the monsters. Even if you don't run into another entity in here, that noise is going to drive you insane. How can you be expected to get any sleep with that racket? All you can do is keep moving. You try doors. Many of them won't budge. You doubt that there's even something on the other side of most of them. You're getting exhausted. That feeling of being watched returns and becomes all-consuming. Is something following you? Your nerves are replaced by curiosity when you find a door that looks different. It seems like a way into a service elevator, except with no buttons to call it or open the doors. 
Instead, you pry open the door and slide it into the eerily well-lit cabin within. There are no buttons on the inside either, but when you're safely situated beyond the automatic door, it closes behind you. Tinny elevator music begins to play as the elevator moves and the sound of machinery becomes gradually more distant. Thank goodness for that, you think. The elevator rumbles to a halt, silence for a moment, and you find yourself wondering what exactly is happening. Just when you begin to wonder if the door will never open, it does, and there's something very different on the other side. Welcome, Explorer. Just when you think you're out, we pull you back in, don't we? But don't worry. We'll be here to keep you company as you traverse ever deeper into the liminal nightmare that is the back rooms. And hey, would you look at that? You're on level four. What a beautiful place. Breathe in the twin scents of fresh, warm copy paper and what smells faintly like burning rubber. Spread your toes on the shoe gray carpet. Take in the full glorious palette of gray on the many anodyne walls. There's a good reason that people call this level the abandoned office. It's funny in a bleak sort of way. Previous levels might have appeared more overtly spooky or dangerous, but this one sends a unique chill down your spine. You venture forth in eerie silence keeping your distance from the wire-filled pillars that you know could be concealing all manner of freaky, aggressive monsters. There's an odd lump in your throat as you progress. You've been here before. Well, not here, exactly, but in offices just like it back in your native reality, never in any position you were proud of. You were the intern, scrambling for coffee orders and trying desperately to remember the names of your superiors. You were the minute taker, dutifully recording notes as words you didn't understand or cared about flew past you a mile a minute. At the height of your power, you were just another numbers droid, inputting anonymous data into vast, incomprehensible systems for reasons that were beyond your understanding and pay grade. You never did anything of value and the pathetic paycheck you got at the end of every month only served to reaffirm this. Here on level four, you feel like you're walking through the carcass of a life you left behind, a reminder of the emptiness you ran from, and even the greater emptiness you've arrived in. You haven't even encountered a hostile entity here yet, and yet you feel your pulse pounding with an even deeper kind of existential dread. The silence of the back rooms emphasizes the loudness of your thoughts. There are so many things you tell yourself you were running from when you first set your mind to entering the back rooms. Bills, taxes, obligations, alienation, purposelessness, pain, regret, debt, wasted years, a crappy home, a crappy job, no friends, no family, not living, not even really surviving, just being. But here on level four, you find yourself looking at things with a greater degree of clarity. Sure, all those things are problems, but they weren't the big problem, were they? The thing you were really running from was being you. And sadly, you're you here too. You try to push all those bleak thoughts out of your head. What does it help you to believe these things? The back rooms is all about survival. If you find yourself slipping too much into your own internality, it leaves you as a sitting duck for a truly dangerous creature, lurking out here in the mazes of hallways, electrical pillars, and abandoned dust gathering cubicles. You have to be fully present and constantly aware of your surroundings. There's something oddly compelling about the environment of level four. Despite your own very personal existential baggage, this place is oddly more inviting than a lot of what you've seen. It doesn't have an endless drone or walls that are deadly to touch, nor nauseating damp carpets and a thick toxic miasma hanging in the air. It feels like a snapshot of the year 1999, on the precipice of the millennia and the world changing forever, just without any of the people in it. That much can be expected of the back rooms, at least. You walk down darkened corridors and through doors marked in a language you don't understand or even recognize. You're smart enough to know the drill by now, explorer. You need to search for supplies, other friendly explorers trapped in here with you, and of course, 
and exit to the next level. You keep walking for hours, occasionally breaking to sit on a rotating office chair, just for your own amusement. The lack of entities on this level seems almost conspicuous, doesn't it? Especially after what an onslaught of vicious creatures these last few levels were. Not that you want to look a well-earned breather in the mouth. There's another thing about this level that you can't help but find a little peculiar. This is the first backrooms level you've seen that has actual windows here. Of course, some of them are completely blacked out, as can be expected, but some of them seem real, with actual light filtering through them. Does that mean there's a way out? Or at least some kind of externality to an otherwise claustrophobic nightmare that is the back rooms? Tentatively not even daring to hope, you approach one of the windows. Something has to be exuding all this light, doesn't it? But outside, you see another impossibility that seems typical of this baffling alternate dimension. A spiral made up of thousands of other parallel windows built into an endless tesseract of walls. Down below, it stretches off into a kind of dark and unknowable infinity. Part of you wonders what'll happen if you'll pry the window open and jump out, but you're aware that it might go on for billions of miles. For all you know, there might not even be a bottom. You could be doomed to die of starvation mid-air. So perhaps an experimental jump isn't the best idea, you think. But this does open up a few different fascinating lines of inquiry. You know this is the view out of one of the windows. Who's to say it'll be the same out of the others? You've entered new levels through plenty of means before. No clipping, doors, elevators. Who's to say you don't enter level five by climbing through an office window on level four? So you begin checking the windows. Again, many of them are totally blacked out. You consider trying to scrape away the paint at first, then realize that in the back rooms, if the world itself doesn't want you looking at something, it's best to be compliant and heed its orders. You don't want to end up like one of the many thousands who would see something so terrible in the back rooms that it utterly shattered their sanity. You keep looking until you see something that catches your eye in the distance. Is someone standing behind one of the windows? It seems like a mere silhouette, but from the shape of it, it seems like it's a human, not one of the many vaguely humanoid monstrosities that littered the endless miles of the back rooms. And if it was possible to get onto the other side of some of these windows, then maybe your theory about escaping level four via one of these windows actually holds some water. There's only one way to find out. There's no time to waste. You make a run for the window, hoping the person on the other side will see you and open up. And as luck would have it, they do. The window starts to open and you see the person on the other side reaching out to take your hand and help you over the ledge. You're delighted. You couldn't be happier to leave this horrible level and all the painful memories it dredges up within you. That's when you hear someone scream, no. You're stopped in your tracks as the iron grips of several hands clasp around your body. You panic and begin to thrash around, worrying that some of the entities have gotten the jump on you. But in reality, the exact opposite has happened. You take another look at the hand reaching out of the window for you. It's solid black, like a living shadow. It's clawed fingers extending towards you, grasping, clawing, beckoning. The ones grabbing you and pulling you away from its demonic grip, on the other hand, are all too human. They know about the treacherous window monsters that lurk on level four, and they have no intention of letting you fall victim to their tricks either. When they pull you far enough from the window that the hand begins to recede back behind the panes, they loosen their grip and let you breathe. You'll sure as hell be bruised tomorrow, but at least this way, you're actually going to live to see tomorrow. Because your mama raised you right, you thank your rescuers profusely before asking them who the hell they are. They tell you that they're a scouting party from the Major Explorers Group Base Omega, the largest human faction in all of the back rooms. With them, you're in safe hands at the very least. Once you've gotten over the shock of yet another near-death experience, they help you up and escort you to Base Omega. It's heavily fortified, despite largely being made of discarded cubicle pieces and office furniture, and surrounded by a sizable force of major explorer group soldiers, wheeling everything from machetes to assault rifles. Your saviors tell you that this is the second largest base that the group operates in all of the back rooms, and because there are relatively few entities on level four, a large number of humans congregate there. 
It's a relief to know that even in an environment as terrifying and utterly inhospitable as the back rooms, the human race, or at least pockets of it, can still find a way to thrive. You're offered food and plentiful almond water. As you sit with a group of fellow explorers eating, drinking, and swapping war stories, you decide to pose a question you've been wondering for a while now. What's the deal with almond water? Rather than reeling off into some bad imitation Seinfeld spiel, a fellow explorer tells you that almond water is more than just a refreshment, it's a lifesaver. Not only will it stop you from dying of dehydration and malnutrition, but it will also boost your immunity from the aggressive pathogen that turns you into a wretch. In some cases, the chemical content of almond water even seems to repel certain backroom's entities meaning it can save your life in a tense situation if you don't have a working weapon on your person. As you receive this fascinating lecture, you make a mental note to grab a few extra bottles of almond water before you leave. Wait, you want to leave? Asks another one of the explorers. <laughs> Level 4 is one of the safer levels, especially here at Base Omega. It gets so much worse from here. Why would you want to descend to even more dangerous levels? You sigh and tell them it'd be hard to explain. You just have too many bad memories here. Nobody questions you further. While some get to the back rooms by accident, all those who came here by choice know better than to question another person's reasons. When you finish your meal, you ask a local guide at Base Omega to take you to the exit. You're ready to move on. A small group with flashlights and weapons leads you to a long, dark corridor not far from the base terminating in a glowing green sign that seems to suggest an exit, even though you can't seem to understand the lettering. You gulp and walk forwards, wondering if this is right. Maybe you should listen to the other explorers. Maybe it would be best to just stay here, come what may. Surely the past is something you can come to terms with. Then again, if that was in the cards, would you have ever come to the back rooms at all? You take a deep breath and walk through the door. Welcome to Level 5, Explorer. Welcome, old chap. How are you feeling? You look tired. Perhaps ready to finally take the weight off your feet, eh? Those last few levels of the back rooms have really been taking a toll on your health, happiness, and sanity. Though really, what did you expect? Deciding to come to this multi-level hell just outside of Earth. But, of course, we're not here to judge. Where would be the fun in that? We're just here to guide you along your journey and document it every step of the way. And we hope you're ready for some good old-fashioned hospitality, because that's exactly what you'll find here. Welcome to Level 5, the Terror Hotel. You enter the main hall and immediately have your senses caressed by the faint smell of lavender-scented air freshener and the low, steady hum of smooth jazz. How could something that is, in theory, so incredibly relaxing also be so oddly terrifying? All the other backroom's levels have been so overtly hostile, or at least unwelcoming to human presence, but something about this place just seems to invite you in. It's made up to look like a classy hotel from the early 20th century, perhaps the 1920s or 1930s. It awakens half-formed memories of places you're not sure you'd ever actually been in your childhood, as well as a documentary you watched once on the Stanley Hotel, a centuries-old hotel in Estes Park, Colorado, that inspired Stephen King to write The Shining. And anything that reminds you of The Shining's Overlook Hotel is probably bad news. So you proceed with caution, knowing danger could be around any corner here. You quite enjoy the smooth jazz, but once or twice, you find yourself wondering if there's something else you can hear under that fine piano and saxophone. Unintelligible whispers in a language that seems equal parts familiar and alien. You find your eyes drawn to oil paintings on the wall, all portraits of what you can only assume are long-dead strangers. Such is the way of the back rooms. You wonder for a few scant moments whether the eyes of the paintings are following you. Anywhere else, this would be a crazy thing to think, but in the back rooms, anything seems to be possible. Occasionally, the whispers behind the unending flow of smooth jazz seem to get louder or quieter as you traverse the ornate halls of the hotel, marked by fine mahogany furniture, Turkish rugs on hardwood flooring, Beautiful vases brimming with flowers that should surely be long dead by now, right? 
This whole place seems startlingly clean compared to the rest of the back rooms. No dust, no smudges, it's perfectly pristine, as though an invisible cleaning staff is working to maintain it around the clock. You're almost lulled into a false sense of security when you feel a tap on your shoulder and pivot on your heels with an awkward, stifled yelp. But all that stretches out behind you is a long, winding hallway with not a soul in sight. Suddenly, something moves above you, and you instinctually dart out of the way. That's because the back rooms has taught you well to remain on guard at all times. And good thing, too, because the creature fluttering above you is a female death moth. You remember being told about these creatures by members of the major explorers group on other levels, and you assume, correctly we might add, that they have some kind of a hive or nest on this level. While behavior can vary from specimen to specimen when it comes to the death moths, it follows that the males of the species are relatively harmless, while the females are decidedly not. They've been known to engage with extreme aggression, especially nearby to their nests. They're also capable of spitting acid, which will really put a dent in your otherwise relatively pleasant day. You know that these creatures are best avoided at all costs. Thankfully, the death moth seems to only have eyes for a nearby lamp, much like its non-anomalous earth moth counterparts. What a relief, they're so plentiful around here. When you're confident that the death moth is gone, you quietly get up and proceed. You've got no interest in getting your face melted off today, or any other day for that matter. After so many encounters with the most horrific monsters you can imagine over the last few months, you're always alert for potential horrific threats, often hiding in plain sight. That's why, when you see a small black and white cat wandering around, you immediately expect that it will explode or grow tentacles or actually be a lure controlled by a giant fish or spider creature hiding just outside your line of sight. Funnily enough, the last thing you expect is it to come over and start talking to you. And yet, that's exactly what it does. Life can be a little strange like that, friends. The cat approaches and says, Hello there, explorer. I'm Samantha. I like to frequent the Level 5 Hotel. Rather nice, isn't it? Partly out of the sheer surreality of the situation, you blindly agree. Say, you wouldn't happen to have any meat on you, she says in an oddly insistent tone that makes you think it's best to obey her. If you give me some, I'll tell you your fortune. It's a fair trade. For a moment, you worry you don't have anything on you to satisfy Samantha the talking cat. But then you remember that before coming down here, you packed a number of supplies in your backpack, including a turkey Slim Jim. It wasn't the best, but hey, it was meat. You get it out of your bag and offer it to Samantha, who eats it before replying, you're going to be offered a deal by something extremely dangerous and leaving. What a heartwarming prophecy, you think sarcastically. In light of that, all you can really do is just keep moving. Your journey continues down the expansive network of fancy corridors that make up Level 5's main hall. How could such fine traditional opulence end up feeling so incredibly unwelcoming? Now and then you notice swarms of death moths in the distance and continue making the wise choice of hiding away in the dark corners until they've passed. Occasionally you'll see dead ones on the ground, being feasted on by strange horned rat-like creatures known as death rats. It's all one big perfect ecosystem of strangeness down here. Eventually you find yourself somewhere different. There's a silver plaque next to a grand set of mahogany doors with the engraved moniker, The Beverly Room. You venture inside, hoping Beverly isn't some nightmare creature that'll immediately rip you to shreds or shake you down for more meat in exchange for vague psychic readings. But instead, you find a gorgeous network of grand ballrooms, the kind that you imagine must have hosted countless Shining-esque parties back in the day. The only notable piece of furniture in these otherwise cavernous rooms is a table, covered in an assortment of esoteric items, including various drinks, that you know better by now than to sample, and a half-finished game of Mahjong. There's an odd aura of evil coming off of the game board that somehow tells you that you need to stay away. The last thing you notice before putting some distance between you and the mysterious table is a paper note, scrawled quickly reading, Beware the Beast. In the back rooms, you really wish it would be more specific. You feel another tap on your shoulder and quickly turn around. 
expecting to see nothing but instead, against all odds, saying, Amelia Earhart, yes, that Amelia Earhart, standing behind you, looking exactly the way she did when she disappeared on that fateful and monumental flight. It turns out that many famous people who just mysteriously went missing in the past ended up inside the back rooms after an unexpected no-clip. After all, it really can happen to anyone. Before you can say a word, she puts a finger up to her lips and shushes you. There's clear fear in her eyes. Suddenly, you can hear a mysterious growling noise coming from somewhere. Honestly, it really isn't clear where it's coming from. It seems almost like it's being projected directly into your head. This, naturally, leaves you feeling a little nervous. But Amelia Earhart, who seems to know what she's doing, takes you by the hand and leads you away to a nearby hall, where the two of you hide in different dark crevices. You have the good sense to just stay put and wait as the growling gets louder and louder. But soon, it's ear-splitting, almost deafening. Part of you wants to scream just to drown it out, but you get the sense that doing so would mean instant death. That's when you see it. A huge quadrupedal mass made of multicolored pipe cleaners? <laughs> You'd laugh if it wasn't so utterly terrifying. And you're right to not make a sound, because this creature is a growler, a highly aggressive and predatory entity that hunts down any living things it can find to assimilate and devour. It uses echolocation to hunt its prey, so any noise you made would have spelled certain doom for you. The one saving grace is that growlers are phenomenally stupid, so it doesn't spend long looking for you when you aren't immediately evident. Soon after it arrives, it moves on, taking that horrific psychic growling with it. You breathe a sigh of relief when you're just back to whispers and smooth jazz. But by the time you feel brave enough to exit your hiding place, Amelia Earhart is sadly long gone. You had so many interesting historical questions for her too. Instead, you just keep walking. Because that's what you've learned to do in the back rooms. At least, the locale here is a little more visually stimulating than the other levels you've been trapped in. You look up at the portraits on the walls and notice something eerie. They're all smiling now, with wide, toothy grins. You remember reading back in high school why people never smiled for these old portraits. The painting process could take hours on end, so it's always best to let your face assume a relaxed position. Big smiles on portraits this old seem to be profoundly unnatural. Oh, I wouldn't say that, old chap. I think it's nice they look so happy. Don't you? You hear that voice ring out. It's smooth, clear, classy, and refined and yet seems to have an undertone of almost limitless malice, like a pleasant well-groomed pond atop a lava-spewing volcano. You turn towards the voice and see its origin. A man, well, kind of, standing in the hall about ten feet away from you. He's wearing a fine suit, but one thing seems off about him. Maybe it's his vibe, his cadence, or the fact he appears to have a green cuttlefish for a head. Before you can formulate a joke about how you must have accidentally wandered into the Hasbin Hotel and are now standing face to face with Wish.com's Alistair the Radio Demon, the mysterious cuttlefish-headed man speaks up again. I'm the proprietor of this hotel, you see. I take great pride in knowing that it's running smoothly at all times. But you see, it's a hard job for just one man, even as hard as a worker as I. Would you consider becoming a business partner of mine in the hotel business in exchange for equity and other benefits? It's been a surreal day. You've been hustled for Slim Jims by a talking cat who can predict the future, saved from a pipe cleaner monster by Amelia Earhart, and it now seemed like you're being roped into an MLM by Davy Jones' Sigma male grindset cousin. Maybe it would be a good idea to just settle down and get into the hotel business on level 5. A bit of stability would certainly be nice, wouldn't it? The stranger seems to sense you're mulling it over and moves in for the kill. How about you come back to my office and we'll get the papers drawn up, eh? I'll give you an incredible deal. Deal. That word. Suddenly, everything clicks into place. You remember Samantha's prophecy. You're going to be offered a deal by something extremely dangerous. The paper from the table in the Beverly room also flashes back to you. Beware the beast. 
That's when you have your usual suspects moment and it all clicks together. This is not a legitimate business partner. Oh no. This budget bill cipher is actually the beast of level 5. The most dangerous entity on the entire level and you need to get out of there. Now. You turn and run at full speed, not caring about anything else. You can still hear the fish face freak calling out, You're missing out on the deal of a lifetime! Behind you. But you're not interested in playing any of his squid games. All you need is to get the hell out of there and find a safe zone. You run past death moths, death rats, and even hounds on your way out, but you'd rather deal with them than make a deal with the beast. Cause this is one Mr. Beast who won't give you money. He'll only give you pain and suffering. You find your way to a heavy iron door marked maintenance and run into the room behind it. This is how you discover the third and final section of level 5, the boiler room. Filled with vintage boiler technology and pipes, it makes you feel oddly nostalgic for the many pipes that infested prior levels. It feels like coming back home after a long period of staying in, well, a hotel. There's also a familiar nutty smell coming from the liquid dripping out of a nearby cracked pipe. You take a sip and find, to your immense relief, that it's almond water. The pipes are filled with delicious, rejuvenating almond water. You drink your fill and fill a canteen, then walk deeper into the boiler room. The deeper you go, the hotter it gets, but suddenly, there's a light in the distance. You brave the heat, panting and sweating from the intensity until finally, you reach the light. Things will never be the same again after that. Welcome, Explorer. You just keep surviving, don't you? How impressive! We still can't decide if that's a blessing or a curse yet, though perhaps a little time on level 6 will help clear up that confusion for you. Maybe it'll even be your light in the dark. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke, but you'll get it soon enough. You find your way into a hallway that looks like an entrance to a different place. You're sweating buckets with the metal tendrils of the boiler room behind you, belching steam and exuding ambient heat. You thank whatever deity or invisible force you believe in for the fact you were able to fill up your almond water supplies from the pipes, because if you hadn't, you surely would have sweated to death from dehydration. As you approach the hallway, you see a handwritten note pinned to the entrance. Of course, you've learned to heed little clues like this, so you unpin the note and give it a read. It says the following, A couple days ago, I saw someone rush out of the entrance to level 6. Well, rush is a strong word. He limped, his left eye was missing, he was clutching his chest, and one of his legs was clearly broken horribly and trailing blood. He looked like he shouldn't have been alive, and from the sound of what he was saying, he didn't think so either. He said he'd been attacked. That much was obvious. But the nature of what attacked him was particularly unnerving to me. Whatever it was, it screamed at him to get away from it before pinning him to the ground and clawing at him. He said it felt like human fingers. He said it sounded like a human voice. I don't know where he is now. Some MEG operatives whisked him away to get his wounds treated. Maybe he lived, maybe he didn't. But seeing that guy come out of that level in that shape, I still think about it. There aren't supposed to be any entities, right? So picture this, you're in a dark room, you can't see, there's no noise. Hell, you don't even know what it's made out of. Imagine you're in there for a while, say five hours, and every so often you hear a little noise, like something's moving nearby. Wouldn't you start wondering what's going on? What might be going on around you that you don't know about? Wouldn't it start to eat at you a little after a while? Then by hour five, what would you do if something bumped into you? Even if it was a person, you wouldn't know that, would you? You wouldn't stop to consider what it might be. Rationality went out the window at hour three. You just need to survive. And maybe you'd walk away from it all, not knowing what horrible things you'd done in that darkness. Level six isn't dangerous because there's something there. It's dangerous because there's nothing there. Admittedly, you don't pay as much attention to the note as you probably should. While it's hard to admit, you've always been one of those people who kind of sees what they want to see in any given situation. After all, your galaxy brain idea to escape your crappy life was to invest all your energy into getting into this hellscape. And can you really say it improved anything? No. That's why, upon reading the note, 
Your myopic takeaway is, wait, there are no entities on this level? That's awesome. After everything you've faced so far, you're beyond eager to jump into a new level with no actual threats. After all, you've got plenty of almond water and snacks. This should be a cakewalk. A wonderful little break from all the horrors you've dealt with. But when you actually enter, you begin to realize that your optimism for this place was a little misplaced. It is completely dark. Just utter, impenetrable Vanta Black. You're in a universe that feels like it's never known light now. You pull out your most powerful flashlight and switch it on to shed a little light on the situation, metaphorically and literally, but the light seems to simply not travel. Even when you put your hands right in front of your face, you don't see them. You realize suddenly why there are no entities here. This place could never support any kind of life. Only darkness lives here. You realize that you're going to need to make your way through this place through touch alone. You reach out and feel the clammy, smooth walls. It occurs to you suddenly just how incredibly quiet this place is. It might be the most silent place you've ever been. You can hear your own heart beating every inhale and exhale, the blood vessels pumping through your ears. You feel like you're on a level of the back rooms that somehow hadn't even loaded yet. You are the only asset in existence here. Your brain reorients to a new goal now. You need to get the hell out. So you begin moving through this oppressive blanket of darkness. All you can do is hug the walls and move forward, hoping that you don't trip over. That's why you need to move slowly too. If you tripped over and got turned around, you'd be irreparably lost in this place. And in this kind of darkness, they'd never even find your bones. Mm, what a nasty thought. So you try to push all these nasty thoughts out of your head and keep your eyes on the prize. You've survived every level up to now, even ones that were full of far more dangerous entities. You can survive this one too, right? But there's undeniably something about the darkness and the silence that takes on a frightening life of its own, an oppressive effect on your already fragile mental health. As the minutes, then hours pass, you begin to hear strange things in the dark, like scuttling sounds, footsteps. Was that someone else breathing? Oh no, oh no. The paranoia is starting to set in. But didn't that note say that there were no entities in here? It must be your mind playing tricks on you, right? But what if it isn't? Suddenly a terrible thought crosses your mind and flushes your system with a surge of icy dread. The back rooms are filled with tricksters. Windows that look normal but are ready to pull you to your death. Monsters disguised as puddles. Beasts that masquerade as humans by stealing and wearing their skin for God's sake. What's to say that a human being wrote that letter you read? Wouldn't that be the perfect cover for a malicious, intelligent entity? Writing a note basically telling you to let your guard down while it waits inside ready for the kill? Your calm composure plummets into a pit of anxiety and fear. Are you alone in here? You keep hearing those noises. Scuttling, chittering, whispers. What could it be? A six-foot cockroach with a switchblade or a giant unkillable spider who wants to drink your liquefied guts? Or something so much worse? Something truly unknowable? Something truly, cosmically, nightmarish? You're prepared to walk into some Lovecraftian fever dream, but instead something else somehow steps from the darkness, illuminated by some unknowable light source. And it isn't some eldritch beast, it's worse. It's your old boss, Mr. Bateman. The one who fired you from the last job you had before you decided to give it all up for the backroom's embrace. He's wearing that same nasty, hate-filled sneer from the day he called you into his office to give you the axe, sending you back into poverty. He rolls his eyes dismissively. So this is where you went after I canned your sorry ass, he says with a cruel chuckle. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. Of course you'd run away from responsibility into some strange dark crevice like the worthless little insect you are. <laughs> Good thing too. Better wasting away in here than adding to the surplus population back on Earth. <laughs> but now one thing, you're going to be as useless here as you were out there. Never forget that. You're at a loss for words. Your body is shaking with a mix of rage and despair. How can this be happening, you wonder? Then it hits you. This is a hallucination. You remember reading an article a couple years back about how the mind needs stimuli. 
and when it's deprived of that stimuli, it avoids total madness by making its own. First with subtle auditory hallucinations, and if it persists for long enough, detailed audiovisual hallucinations. Like, for example, imagining your boss berating you in the bowels of the back rooms. It's all just an illusion created by your own mind. Though admittedly, that doesn't make it hurt any less to hear it. You push forward through him into the darkness, diffusing him into vapor. But his cruel words and your knowledge that they originated in the depths of your own mind wound you. It's only a few hours of walking in the darkness, feeling along the cold concrete of the walls that you get another ghostly hallucinatory visit from the past you wish you could forget. It's Mrs. Newman, one of your 11th grade teachers from high school. She always failed you, berated you, and kept you behind after class. Just seeing her there, enshrined in light like whatever the opposite of an angel is, you can feel yourself breaking out into a cold sweat. Fears and anxieties you haven't felt in a decade are clawing their way up the walls of your heart and into your mind. You'd genuinely rather deal with monsters. She clears her throat like she always did, and says in that same shrill voice that always cut right through you. Well, 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 fancy seeing you here in this dark and dismal place. It suits you. This is always what I assumed the inside of your head looked like. God, I knew you wouldn't amount to much. You were always a lousy kid. But this? This is something else. I hope you enjoy it here, because I know for a fact that this is where you belong. You can feel the tears stinging your eyes. She's not telling you anything you didn't know, but that doesn't make it hurt even a smidgen less to hear it relitigated all over again. After all, that's why you're here, isn't it? Because you were so worthless and pathetic out there, you needed to run away from reality. You knew there was no place for you in that world, so you hoped against hope that there would be some small place for you in this one was there. You do what you've always tried to do, push through the pain and move on. Mrs. Newman shatters like glass and disappears as you walk through her. And just like that, you're in total darkness again, with silence as your only company. It is truly the loneliest place in the world, but that's fine. You lie to yourself. You're used to loneliness, but not this kind of loneliness. Part of you could even pray to run into a smiler just so you'd have something to keep you company. You'd take attempts on your life over more emotional torment right now. It just hurts too much. It's several hours after that wandering and wobbling through the darkness that you encounter them. The ones that you thought, that you hope you would never see again. But there they are, emerging from the darkness, your dear old mom and dad. Brows twisted in disapproval and eyes burning with the low, gnawing malice that you know they've always had for you. You feel yourself getting weak at the knees. You try to form the words, but nothing comes out. Your fear and horror are bone deep. They speak, somehow using one voice between them. You are nothing. A waste of space. We wish we never had you. You made both our lives worse. Again, nothing you didn't already believe, but to hear it puts you through agony. Every word lacerates you. You begin to sob and just keep walking, having no idea how much time passes. All you can hear is your own crying, bouncing off the walls of all these dark, narrow corridors and bouncing back to you, like a reminder of just how terrible you feel. This is what you came here to escape, so why can't you escape it here? Your thoughts are finally jogged when you almost trip and fall down the stairs. Wait, stairs? Does that mean a way out? It's hard to even quantify the relief you feel going down those stairs, following what, inexplicably, sounds like breaking tides of the ocean down below. But hey, you'll sure as hell take that over the oppressive silence of level 6. You've learned now that there are things far worse than monsters in the dark, suffocating halls of the back rooms. You take a deep breath and walk into the light. Welcome back, Explorer. We hope you brought your swimsuit, because level 7 is considerably more, well, let's say, immersive than the previous levels. And we mean that in the entirely literal sense. If you happen to suffer from thalassophobia, I'm afraid you're about to have a truly terrible time. 
But really, given the near infinite number of backrooms levels out there, there's going to be at least one or two that are perfectly tailored to your specific personal phobias. Oh, doesn't it feel wonderful to be represented? Welcome to level 7, Land Lover. First things first though, as soon as you enter level 7, you pop out into the entrance room. This is about as typical as things get here, so do take the time to drink it all in and appreciate the familiarity before we send you into the madness that lurks beyond the walls. This room doesn't seem that odd, by backroom standards at least. There's a large bookcase against the left wall, filled with a variety of bizarre, unknown books you've never heard of before. Not that you were ever the bookish type out there. But that's not the only furniture in the room. You've also got a small coffee table, a chair, a fluorescent light overhead, and a number of other miscellaneous pieces. There are also some items that other prior explorers have left behind, perhaps to make what follows a little easier. You notice a rebreather and a series of oxygen tanks that you can only hope are full. You wonder for a moment whether you're meant to be exploring the large but relatively shallow puddle sitting in the middle of the room. A cursory check with the ruler you brought with you, thankfully, proves that this puddle really is just a regular puddle. This, naturally, causes your attention to turn to the mysterious door on the other side of the room. You've learned to trust the significance of strange doors in the back rooms. You approach with caution, taking the small revolver you've been packing for a few levels now out of your pocket. You slowly open the door, only to see a defiance of physics that almost breaks your brain to even consider. It's as though you're looking down on an ocean, perhaps five meters from you. Somehow, the wall that seems like a sidewall here is the ceiling to the ocean below. Talk about trippy. But your mind has already spent some time adjusting to the strangeness of this world. You're already thinking of potential solutions. If you can find some rope in this room, you can create a passage between these two gravitationally displaced zones. So that's exactly what you do. You find a rope, anchor it to one of the larger pieces of furniture in the room, and drop the other half down towards the ocean. Brilliant move, explorer. Next, you consider the need for a vessel. Perhaps you can create a makeshift raft out of items in the room. How clever, you think to yourself. I'm really getting a handle on this whole thing at long last. You decide to pour the books out of the bookcase and use the other items around the room to modify it into a makeshift raft. You also stock your backpack with the rebreather and various oxygen tanks. With all this and the supplies you already have, crossing the ocean should be a piece of cake. You throw your makeshift raft down into the depths and rappel down the rope towards it, feeling like some classic adventure hero. Soon enough, you're sailing smoothly across what feels like an infinite expanse of dark, rolling water. You feel like you're at Point Nemo, the part of Earth's ocean that is further from any point of land on the planet. Even with all your supplies, there would come a point when thirst and hunger would drive you mad, all the way to the grave. But hopefully, you tell yourself, you'll find something resembling civilization, or at least whatever passes for it in the back rooms before then. You notice there's no sky up above, just an endless concrete ceiling five meters above you. And despite the lack of light sources, everything seems to have at least a dim glow down here. You sail for a while, remembering how much you enjoyed learning about seafaring pirates as a kid. You're just living the dream out here, aren't you? You turn your eyes downwards into the black depths of the mysterious ocean and notice something a little strange. You can't see any fish, literally any of any variety. It's like the ocean itself is just dead. Something you've learned about the backrooms is that oftentimes, the absence of entities can be just as anxiety-inducing as their overt presence. Certain frightening questions begin to plague your mind like, were there never other creatures down there? Or worse, did someone else down there kill them? Your frightening existential musings are interrupted by a sudden act of shocking violence. A spear suddenly protrudes from the bottom of your raft. Its tip appears to be some creature's fang sharpened to an even deadlier point. There's something uniquely terrifying about this. Up until now, you haven't encountered an aggressive backrooms entity that was capable of using tools and weapons. Things just went up a level in danger. But you can't really concern yourself with the wider implications of this act when something underwater is still trying to smite you. The spear comes up through the floor of the raft again and again. You're lucky that you're able to dodge each strike, but that doesn't stop water from flooding into the raft quickly causing it to sink. 
The spear comes up through the ground again, and you fall backwards off the boat, into the water. You scramble to put on the rebreather as the icy cold of the water steals your last gasp. As your eyes adjust, you see the monster destroying your beautiful raft. You'd learn later that people call this creature Tiny. It's a terrifyingly fast and aggressive humanoid fisherman that rules the upper echelons of the ocean here on level 7. It's almost difficult to make him out through the water, but you can clearly see spots of bioluminescence on his lithe, athletic body. It's difficult to tell where Tiny's body ends and the twisted hide of another aquatic creature he's wearing begins. You're just immensely thankful he hasn't seemed to notice you. Instead, he's stabbing away at your sinking raft. His voice carries on out of him in a warbling psychic vibration, a telepathic war cry of dominance and supremacy. He yells, Another weakling felled by the master of the Black Waters. What a pathetic, pathetic disappointment. You remain completely still, sucking in the stale oxygen of the reef breather as Tiny finishes tearing the raft apart and swims off in another direction. Your silence has saved your life in this moment because Tiny has the ability to detect sounds from miles away if they're loud enough and trace them immediately to their source. If you'd panicked and thrashed around, you would have taken a spear right through the face, which seriously would have impeded your ability to adventure through the back rooms. But even with Tiny gone, you're still in the middle of an alien ocean without a paddle. You take a deep breath and try to channel your years of playing Subnautica. Perhaps you begin to think the only way out of this hell is down. That's certainly been the case in other backrooms levels, so why wouldn't it be the case here? All you need to do is steal yourself and begin your dive. After all, if Tiny has killed everything else here, you at least know he's the only creature you have to deal with on this level, right? Currently, you're up on the highest level of the ocean known as the Daylight Zone. It's the least overtly strange and anomalous of the areas you'll find in here, save for the fact it's one of Tiny's favorite hunting grounds. It's pretty much completely barren, with the exception of salt water and a pervasive sense of ennui. You keep going deeper, beginning to faintly worry about the very real possibility you'll run out of air. Thankfully for you, at least, the air of level 7 has a special quality that allows you to hold it in your lungs for much longer than conventional air. So if anything is killing you underwater today, it won't be the lack of air. Does that feel comforting at least? It should. Eventually, after what feels like an eternity of swimming, you make like Rod Serling and enter the Twilight Zone, the next level below the Daylight Zone you were just occupying. As the name suggests, it's a lot darker than the previous level, but that's not all. You turn around and see strange detritus floating through the dark and freezing water around you. Pieces of rusted metal, mysterious bone fragments, and in some cases whole skeletons from both unknown aquatic mammals and mysterious unearthly fish. This whole place seems to genuinely be nothing more than some kind of watery mass grave. As you get further into the Twilight Zone, you can even feel the pressure growing around your body. Part of you thinks that maybe you should turn around and swim back up to the top, but for what? For Tiny to impale you on his spear? You hold your breath and change the canister on your rebreather. You're committed now. You need to keep going deeper and deeper. Soon you reach the next level, an even greater vista of pure darkness and suffocating water pressure. You take out your powerful flashlight and shine it through the deep, dark gloom, seeing skeletons with structures that don't even seem to make sense anymore. This is because you're in the Midnight Zone. We'll give you the good news and the bad news. The good news is that Tiny doesn't dare stray down here, so you're safe from him. The bad news is that it's because something else has claimed this territory. You go deeper, trying to remain calm despite yourself. You're so deep now that the pressure feels like hands all around you, pushing in as though they're trying to force you into a shoebox. Welcome to the Upper Abyss, Explorer. This level is so dark that even your flashlight is having trouble finding the way out there. You wonder for a moment, did something move in that deep and distant dark? Something impossibly big? Well, we hate to tell you this, but yes, yes it did. Meet the thing on level 7. This giant aquatic abomination is the other creature that shares level 7 with Tiny. It's a giant eel-like monster, with a giant mouth capable of swallowing whole buildings in a single gulp and a tail that's approximately 11,000 meters long. It's also omnivorous and hates humans, giving it all the reason in the world to brutally devour them. And contrary to its brutish deep-sea appearance, the thing on level 7 is actually an extremely intelligent being. 
with the capacity for advanced tactical thinking. While it isn't able to communicate telepathically or verbally, it has been shown to have the capacity to write, as we know from its critically successful and commercially popular series of self-published books. Eating people in the upper abyss of level 7 and me, this sort of thing is my bag, baby, by the thing on level 7. We recommend checking the books out, honestly. Despite him being a giant, terrifying aquatic horror, the thing on level 7's prose undeniably has a certain degree of charm and wit, compared to some of the works of Bill Bryson or David Sedaris. Incidentally, you can find them in the entrance room bookshelf if you were the kind of person with enough curiosity to actually look for them, rather than just turning the bookshelf into an ill-fated raft. You wisely decide to turn off your flashlight, because the thing on level 7 is extremely sensitive to light and would likely see it as a very good reason to devour you. That's why you decide to continue the mission as discreetly as possible and continue swimming lower into the abyss as the great body of the Leviathan roils above you. Eventually, while you feel like the pressure is on the precipice of turning your bones into powder, you find your way deep enough to see what appears to be a vast underwater network of mountains and cave systems. This is new, you think. Perhaps a way out? And once again, you think correct. You swim up slightly into the bottom of the Midnight Zone, where you see an unimaginably huge mountain, bigger than anything you can imagine on Earth. You approach, seeing something glowing on the side of the mountain. An opening? A cave mouth. You approach the almost mystical promised aperture beyond eager to leave this aquatic nightmare behind and pass over to the other side at long last. Welcome back, explorer. How about a little spelunking? If it's a cave you crave, then you'll be right at home here. Just be warned these passages can be a little stalactite. And if you're not careful, you stalagmite meet your end here. And if you think these puns are lethal, just wait until you see some of the truly horrific creatures lurking in and around the caverns you're about to risk your life traversing. Welcome to level 8. We hope you brought spare batteries for your flashlight. That's because this level is an incredibly complex and treacherous series of caves, caverns, and tunnels leading off into infinity. Level 8 not only possesses all the unique dangers of the backrooms, but it also has all of the dangers that make regular earth caves hazardous to traverse if you don't have preparation, equipment, and expertise. It's treacherous, uneven terrain largely kept in near dark, with the added danger provided by trickling rivulets of almond water, making the ground and walls extra slippery. Plant life is incredibly sparse here on level 8. The most you're likely to find are some dried up vines and shrubs, owing to the fact that there is seemingly no natural light down here. You also find huge pools of almond water pooling from the drips up above. But unless you're Hank Schrader, you're unlikely to enjoy these pools, because they're also full of minerals many of which have reached toxic levels of buildup. There are also other pools on this level filled with viscous, dark, tar-like fluid. And if that wasn't enough to make you want to stay away from them, we'd also like to formally advise you not to take a dip. Explorers report that stepping into these pools will result in a huge number of horrifying, grasping human hands popping up, grabbing you, and dragging you into the suffocating depths. So, um... <clears throat> Stay clear of those, please. The Major Explorers Group has opened up some safe routes for explorers to traverse, but given the infinite nature of each backroom's level, your chances of actually finding one of these routes is, sadly, incredibly unlikely. Bummer, right? And if your extensive history of gaming in your previous life taught you anything, it's that bad things lurk in the dark, slimy innards of caves. And you saw the descent. So you're fully expanding lesions of pale, flesh-eating bad people be on your ass before you know it. But that would be a pleasant vacation from the things you're actually likely to run into down here. Level 8 has more hostile entities hanging around than you can shake a stick at, even by backroom standards. And one echo tumbling through the darkness of the caves could tell them all exactly where to find you. That's why in this episode, while you're fumbling around in a cave trying not to get killed, eaten, or worse, we're going to give you a rundown of the many beasts you might run into. We'll skip the ones you've already encountered and learned to deal with on previous levels of the backrooms. Because, of course, smilers, crawlers, skin stealers, hounds, clumps, death moths, death rats, and wretches are common here, and instead show you some of the new entities you really should be worrying about right now. First up, you better keep an eye on the walls, in case you fall victim to the deceitful violence of the camo crawlers. These are large humanoid monsters with four powerful arms, 
pincer-like mandibles similar to an insect, grayish-brown skin, in their default state at least, and large, milky-white eyes. This is because, like a lot of creatures who are liable to find inside of a cave, they're blind, and instead locate their victims through powerful hearing and echolocation. But unlike, say, a bat, the camel crawlers don't actively hunt their victims. Instead, they change their skin color to match their surrounding environment, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Next comes a considerably more ethereal creature known as a transporter, or in some cases, a grabber. And sadly, we don't mean Jason Statham or Ethan Hawke will run into you into the back rooms. Sorry. These are actually floating legless shadow people that roam the back rooms more and more frequently the further you go down. For reasons unknown, they have a tendency to appear at T-junctions in passageways. If you don't turn tail and run in enough time, they'll make the passages around you turn into walls, blocking off your escape. At that point, they'll float towards you and grab your shoulders. At this point, one of two things will happen. If you're unlucky, you may just die right there on the spot. If you are ostensibly luckier, you'll be thrown into some other level of the back rooms, where all you can do is hope that you'll be a little safer here. Really, it's best to just avoid the transporter altogether. Speaking of entities that you do well to avoid at all costs, meet the Paralees, some of the most invasive horrors that the backrooms have to offer. These psychic parasites resemble incredibly small garter snakes, which may appear harmless at first, but if they can get close to you, you're in for a horrifying fate. They'll use their psychic abilities to disarm you and crawl right into your ear, at which point they'll lock their teeth onto your brain and begin a three-step process. During the first step, which can last for weeks, the person afflicted will begin to lie uncontrollably, deceiving everyone around them for seemingly no reason. During the second phase, they'll begin to travel around the rest of your body, leading to mental unrest and profound physical discomfort. Your speech will be impaired, and you'll find yourself only able to eternally repeat slithering, crawling, slithering, until stage three takes hold. At this point, the paralee will crawl back into your brain and take full control of your body until you die. It will even lay eggs in your body, leading you to become a breeding host for even more paralees. Sleep tight. Except you really shouldn't sleep, because you might run into a hostile child faceling. We know what you're thinking, wait, why are you telling me this again? I encountered a faceling already on level one. And while you are correct there, there's an important distinction between a faceling and a child faceling. The adults are, for the most part, pretty docile and harmless. But if you see what seems like a strange, long-haired little girl in the distance, then buddy, it is time to run for your life. Child facelings are demonic faceless children with sharp blades and nasty attitudes. And if you get caught off guard by a group of them while you're in the cave systems of level 8, you may end up on the business ends of their blades. Next comes an entity that isn't really actively aggressive, but is still best avoided for reasons we'll discuss very soon. The Fault Crawlers. These are centipede-like entities that live in colonies across the back rooms, with elongated mandibles resembling that of a stag beetle. These creatures are highly poisonous, so we'd advise you to avoid eating them at all costs, if you're that kind of weirdo who just loves eating centipedes for some reason. And again, while they won't ever directly attack you, their presence can be a bad omen, as it can be a sign of more dangerous entities lurking nearby. Speaking of even more dangerous entities, we have one of the most mysterious entities in the upper levels of the back rooms, the Reviox. Despite their somewhat whimsical name, these beasts are not to be trifled with. If ever you enter an area and the ground seems to be vibrating, then it's time for you to get the hell out of there, because you're likely about to be the victim of a hungry emerging Reviok. When you see the ground beginning to crack, it's probably already too late. A pair of huge muscular arms are likely to pop out of the ground and drag you underneath to your doom. Sometime later, your skeleton, picked clean, will be shoved back up to the surface. So be sure to walk without rhythm, and you won't attract the Reviok. Okay, now let's have a little bit of fun and lighten the mood. Just because we're in a cave shrouded in perpetual darkness doesn't mean we have to be all doom and gloom, right? So to make us all feel a little better, how about we hang out with a bunch of huge spiders? Oh, doesn't that sound like fun? Oh, I can just feel the joy and enthusiasm coming off of you. You're in wonderful luck in this regard because level 8 is absolutely filled to the brim with these 8-legged pals. They're so synonymous with this level that these enormous spiders are known as the arachnids of level 8. Let's meet them. The most common forms are simply known as the arachnids. 
Biologically, they're highly variable, coming in a number of colors and ranging in size from 2 centimeters to 2 meters in length. If you're lucky and you stay out of their way, you might avoid one of their highly venomous bites. The mother of all these spiders is known as the Queen Spider, who is massive in size and will absolutely tower over most human beings who dare step into her domain, at 7 to 10 meters in length. It probably goes without saying, she's best avoided, right? And then, there's the third variety of spider lurking on level 8, eager to menace anyone or anything that invades their personal space. The Franken Spiders. Now there's a name that just warms your heart and fills you with absolute comfort and tranquility. These are the friends that just won't go away because, for mysterious reasons, the Franken Spiders have unparalleled regenerative abilities, which keeps them from ever being permanently killed by an explorer or one of the other entities lurking in the back rooms. We recommend keeping a flashlight handy because light can act as a deterrent against the arachnids of level 8, and almond water can work wonders in helping to treat the venom of spider bites when applied topically. And this brings us to the last significant monster of level 8. So significant, in fact, that they have a notable effect on the very topography of the level. These entities are known as the Wranglers. They're huge, snake-like beasts, with the males of the species typically being extremely aggressive and proactive in killing and eating humans, and also, disturbingly, have extremely human-like faces that appear to have broad grins. The more mature specimens have gray skin and glowing eyes, and are capable of twisting their bodies in any way they like. They are able to bore through the caves, twisting their bodies like drills. But that isn't their most dangerous and problematic method of locomotion. There was an incident with an unimaginably huge wrangler on level 8 long before you arrived, detailed as follows in the official Major Explorer Group report on the matter. December 17, 2019, 12.30 a.m. A large deceased occurrence of Entity 75 has been found in Level 8. It was discovered after an unknown wanderer reported it to MEG Team First Response. A team was promptly sent and took seven hours to get to the location with the help of MEG operative Deezer. These operatives tried burning a path to the exit. However, not enough pyro oil was supplied. A second team arrived with more supplies. This allowed a path to be burned through the Entity. At a later date, the rest was burnt away, the amount totaling to two cubic miles. This anomaly is an old male wrangler, and it's the biggest wrangler, possibly the largest entity, recorded. Many public cavern systems in level 8 have been blocked off by a mass of decaying plant-like flesh of a wrangler. The wrangler died during no-clip burrow. It seems to have died of starvation. The number of skeletons and indigestible objects found in here was considerable. These skeletons belong to some unknown entities, some human-made objects, and other essential supplies were found. Other mysterious objects were found as well. The MEG have sent backup teams of Regiment Quick Match to help the wanderers trapped in the caverns of Level 8 due to the large Wrangler corpse. Truly anything can happen in the back rooms, especially in a place as mysterious as Level 8. You take a breath, now knowing the sheer breadth of entities you might face here. You take a careful step forward and fall through the floor into the next level. You wake up with your cheek kissing the moist, dark concrete below. You can scarcely even remember how you got here, but as you awaken and come to, rising shakily to your feet, the most strange and wonderful thought comes over you. Have you finally escaped? Because the locale that surrounds you isn't an endless office or an underground industrial hell, nor a haunted hotel or a vast, terrifying ocean. It's a suburb at twilight. One that you vaguely remember. Did you grow up here? You've spent decades trying to repress some of the more unpleasant details of your childhood and adolescence. Rejection, bullying, the shame and disappointment of your parents and teachers, so the background of all these censored scenes seems oddly blurred. You breathe in the cool night air. It feels fresh. It feels real. Can it be true that after all the fear and suffering, all the lessons to make you appreciate what little you had in your native reality. The backrooms have spit you back out into it. It is possible, but you need more data to confirm or deny either way. You begin wandering the dark and desolate streets. It feels familiar, of course, but something feels off. Something hard to even articulate. There seems to be no cars, not even parked in the driveways of the many middle-class houses and cheap-looking McMansions. 
Though you reassure yourself that plenty of people in the suburbs have garages, which could explain why there aren't any visible cars, and who's driving through the suburbs at night anyway. The streetlights are sparse and dim, barely cutting through the gloom, but considering the truly supernatural darkness you've experienced before, your eyes are quick to adjust. A cool mist hangs in the air, caressing your skin. You're hopeful, but not stupid. You're always on the lookout for new entities hiding around every corner, even if you want to believe you've finally escaped the back rooms. You've been through too much to be a fool anymore. Tired of ambiguity, you decide it's time to take a more direct approach. You approach the nearest house and knock on the front door. If you've escaped and you wake the people up inside, they'll probably think you're a huge jerk, but it's at least the most direct way to answer your burning question. But there is no answer. You knock again a little harder this time. Nothing. You can feel your heart rate beginning to quicken. Perhaps one more knock. Maybe they're heavy sleepers, right? That could always be the case. You wrap your knuckles against the door. Knock, knock, knock. To your surprise, it just swings open, revealing a dark hallway within. Almost automatically, you step inside, wanting to at least know what's happening here. Curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back. But in this case, the more you find out about this strange situation you've walked into, the more unnerved you feel. You notice that all the photo frames in the house are empty or oddly blurred, like you're in a display house. You try the light switch, nothing. The power must be out. All the evidence is mounting that something isn't right here. You pull out your flashlight to aid in the search. The house is eerily empty. Something is so wrong here. There are seemingly no signs of human habitation in here, none at all. This place is dead. Eventually, you find yourself in what you assume must be the master bedroom. Strangely, you see that the bed is a mess in here, implying that perhaps someone had slept here not too long ago. That's a good sign, right? You then notice a written note on a large, heavy cabinet to your left. You pick up the note. The top of it reads, I fell through the floor. I sunk down and landed in an unfamiliar place. There were no spiders, but still I felt like I was being watched. Around me, there was a street. Houses and dead trees everywhere. My head felt, and still feels, fuzzy, like TV static in my brain. I lost consciousness, but apparently had an outburst, according to Centurion. I was talking about death, pain, weakness, all kinds of awful things. Level 9 is level 6 on crack. I can tell there are going to be things, but the effects on your mind are bad. Almost as bad as level 6. Well, there goes your hope of escape. Welcome back, explorer. Surely you didn't think it'd be that easy, did you? <laughs> Truth be told, kid, we're just getting started. So you better buckle in and enjoy the ride as best you can. This is level 9, the suburbs. Doesn't it just feel so homely? Suburbia, you're not alone. The lights are on, but no one's home. Well, the lights aren't on, but the point still stands. You're stuck in the back rooms, and if that note is to be believed, there are entities on this level who will want to keep you company. We probably don't need to tell you that these entities are best avoided. But lucky for you, there is one more paragraph on that note. It reads, But hey, it's not all doom and gloom. I think it's already too late for me, but I've left you with a parting gift. It's called a pocket, the weird little piece of jewelry next to the note. You take another look at the cabinet. There's a strange silver brooch with a glowing stone embedded in the center. You feel an almost instinctive hum of power coming off of it that compels you to pick it up. You run your finger across the stone, feeling its subtle charge of supernatural energy course through you. What is this strange little charm? You continue reading the note. This is one of the most valuable objects you can find around here. It lets you put anything of any size as long as it's not alive and inorganic, in your own little private pocket dimension for safe keep. Word of the wise, if you put anything particularly large or heavy in there, don't re-manifest it above your own head. Though if you've made it this far, I hope you're not that stupid. Good luck, fellow explorer. I hope you get out. It feels like a prank. More bizarre trickery. Until you decide to test it out by touching the pocket to the cabinet, causing the whole thing to immediately disappear. Even after all the blatantly supernatural things you've seen down here, Somehow that still shocks you. You're capable of doing actual magic here. There's no denying that's incredibly cool. 
Well, if this is just another backrooms level, then the same rules apply. You need to get out of here and find your way to the next one before you lose your mind or get eaten, or worse, by some kind of horrific nightmare beast. From where you're standing, there's really no time to waste. You make your way back outside onto the dark, cold streets. The concrete below is cracked and worn with dry brown leaves scattered across it. It somehow simultaneously feels like this suburb is a hundred years old and built fresh last week. Such is the unsettling effect of the back rooms. As you begin traversing the dark, damp asphalt roads, you run into the last thing you expect, a group of human beings. They seem tired and dirty, bunched into a tight formation with oddly hollow, vacant eyes. You approach them, hoping to share some information you found about the level and maybe trade some vital supplies. But the closer you get, the more you seem to realize that this is not going to happen. The man at the front of the group turns to you as you approach and says, Have you heard the good word? You reply that no. It's been quite some time since you've heard any good words down here. He doesn't seem to appreciate the joke. Instead, he pulls out a photograph of a hyacinth blue macaw, which appears to be covered in kiss marks. He and the rest of the group seem to show an almost holy reverence for this bright blue parrot. They all begin to chant uncomfortably out of sync, Jerry is everything! Jerry is what I live for! All hail Jerry! Jerry presumably being the macaw. You're really not ready to commit to a new system of faith right now parrot-related or otherwise. So you nod politely and walk briskly away from the crowd of Jerry devotees. You just get the sense that you're going to be better off elsewhere rather than sticking with these parrot proselytes. As you keep walking, you try to take in deep lungfuls of that cool night air and regulate the pace of your breathing. You remember what it said in that note you read earlier. I can tell there are going to be things, but the effects on your mind are bad. Almost as bad as level 6. Considering that level 6 was the site of your previous full-blown mental breakdown, you're not exactly eager for a do-over. You're going to try to keep thinking happy thoughts, despite it all, and find your way out of here. Suddenly, you hear childish giggling and cheering. You quickly look around, worried you're going to be suddenly surrounded by a horde of blade-wielding child facelings. But no, there's nothing standing around you. Oddly enough, you begin to realize that the noises you heard seem to be coming from directly above you. You steel yourself and look up. About 50 feet in the air above you, there are strange flocks of multicolored kites, or at least flying entities that look like kites. Despite the eeriness of the childlike noises, you get the sense that these entities mean you no harm. They're all just flying away in one uniform direction. How odd. You keep walking. Acknowledging that on some level, the back rooms could occasionally be beautiful in their own very peculiar, very unsettling way. After walking for a little longer, you see some lights in the distance. They're moving. Could that be a group of people with flashlights? You get closer, hoping this could be a group of fellow explorers who hadn't fallen into the thrall of Jerry. But as you get closer, you begin to realize that the silhouettes of these new people emerging from the distant haze are not people at all. In fact, they're a group of giant eyeballs, walking on their clusters of optic nerves. Each one has a beam of light emerging from its pupil. These friendly fellows are known as the Neighborhood Watch. And as you wisely intuit that you do not want to be caught in one of those beams and start running in the other direction, the Watch seems to notice your frantic footsteps, though and begins chasing after you. They don't want any interlopers destroying the beautiful tranquility of their suburb. You run until you pass the group of indoctrinated humans from earlier, still chanting their Hail Jerry's. You desperately try to warn them of the incoming threat, but they just don't seem to listen. And then, it's too late. A pair of watchers, the most common variety of neighborhood watch, which float and project their glowing eye beams approach. The second the eye beam passes through the group of Jerry devotees, the devotees immediately disintegrate into ash. And most upsettingly of all, the ash somehow kept screaming. Is it time to run? Again? Just like you always do? That's when something inside of you just snaps. You've spent your whole life running. From your bullies, from your obligations, from your regrets, from your whole life. And ever since you've gotten into the back rooms, you've been constantly on the run too. But not here. Not now. You've survived nine levels of hell being thrown at you. Now it's time to throw a little hell back. Barely even comprehending your own actions, you run over to one of the two watchers at breakneck speeds and grab it by the back of its eyeball. 
where the tendril-like optic nerve connects. You turn it sharply to the side, catching the other watcher in its beam and turning it to ash. It feels good to give that freak a taste of its own medicine, but you're not done. Before the watcher you're grappling with can wrestle free, you grab it by its optic nerves and swing it into the asphalt below again and again until its eye splatters into dead goo all along the unpainted road. You feel like an ancient berserker, undefeatable, a whole lifetime of anger and regret manifested in pure and elegant violence. Then you hear something running at you from the darkness at intense speeds. It's a strider, the second most common type of neighborhood watch creature. Its optic nerves have formed into six giant eight-foot-long legs, and if it touches you with its giant eye, you will be irrevocably absorbed into its mass. You can't fight this one like you fought the two watchers it's coming to avenge, and it's too fast for you to possibly outrun. Is this the end? That's when you have an idea, perhaps the most brilliant of your life, and it's the only thing that can possibly save you right now. You just need to make sure you time it perfectly, because you've only got one chance. You reach into your pocket for, well, the pocket. As the strider is mere meters away from you, you run your thumb over its glowing stone on the center of the brooch. Picture what you want to happen and hope. The strider is getting so close. You can see the hunger in its freakish, bulbous eye. Then, right above it, the huge, heavy cabinet from the master bedroom manifests and falls like a hammer from God. The strider never saw it coming. But the last thing it ever saw was that cabinet falling down onto its eye from above and splattering it against the asphalt. The Strider lays dead. Your KD ratio, 3-0 to you. Well done, Explorer. You really have come a long way, haven't you? <laughs> Perhaps these monsters should be afraid of you. You breathe a sigh, surrounded by the ash that used to be a human and watcher and the unpleasant slime of two exploded eyeballs. The only thing left intact is a photograph of a hyacinth blue macaw laying on the ground. All hail Jerry, indeed. All you can do is keep walking down the dark and empty roads of level 9. It all seems so identical until you notice a grassy area off the side of one of the roads. Interesting. You feel like appreciating something a little more scenic, a little off the beaten track. And is that light you see in the distance? This could be the beginning of a whole new adventure. Who knows what wonders and nightmares await for you on the other side. You smile and walk towards the light across the grass. Want to stay tuned for the next exciting exploration into the backrooms as we delve deeper and deeper into this liminal abyss? Be sure to subscribe to The Backrooms Explained and turn on notifications so you never miss another expedition. Now go check out Level 10, The Field of Wheat, for more exercises into Backrooms Terror.